for the agenda tonight. Moved by Councillor Howes, second by Brian Coleman. All in favor? Any against? Okay, pass. Uh, declaration of pecuniary interests. Do we have any tonight? Uh, Robert Chambers? Oh. No? Okay. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm just uh, connecting here, but I don't have a conflict. Oh, okay. But I did okay. want to add Thanks something to the for that clarification. Oh, okay. Uh, under what? Just, uh, just a suggestion for an agenda item at our next meeting. So under other business. Okay. Do we have any disagreement with doing that? Okay. So under new business, uh, Rob Chambers. Okay, um, adoption of the minutes. Uh, we have no delegations, petitions and presentations, right Heather? Okay, uh, adoption of the minutes from the previous meeting. Do we have a mover? Moved by Mayor Bailey, seconded by Councillor Pierce. All in favor? Okay. Opposed, if any? Seeing none, to declare it passed. Business arising from the minutes, is there any? Okay. Seeing none. Move on to uh, the consent items. Do we have a motion to receive for seven one and seven two? Or is there anybody who would like one push uh, pulled? Okay. Oh, Councilor Gatward. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just have a question regarding the attachment to seven point two point two which was to do with the um, ministry and their new information about the um, webinar, or whatever it is they're holding uh, on various dates. And apparently central region, which we're a part of, didn't have, um, didn't collect any penalties, so we don't get any funding. And I, I'm trying to understand that. And there's information in here about odor guidelines, which we've had odor guide problems with various um, projects in the county. So I wanted to um, ask staff to speak to this email from the ministry. Okay. Um, would we direct that to Pam Doosling or Jessica Ketchen. Through you, the chair, I'm, I'm happy to give a little bit of information. Um, Development Services is, is aware of uh, this information and we're planning to uh, look into the environmental registries on both the proposed land use compatibility guidelines and the odor. And we're happy to provide any information that uh, Council would like back to them. And then in, in terms of the last piece, the administrative uh, monetary penalty expansion, uh, we think that stakeholder consultation is only for that portion, but we are contacting uh, Andrea Martin to find out more. And uh, perhaps we can pass that information along to the clerk. That's fine. Thank you very much. So, uh, Councillor LaFerrier. Yeah, I'd like to move both the consent items, 7.2.1 and 7.2.2, with uh, a note of thanks for the ARU uh, presentation um, report. Quite good. Okay. Do we have a seconder? Seconder, Councilor Bell. Okay, so all in favor? Okay. Opposed, if any? Passed. Thank you very much. 
So staff reports, we have one item, two, three items. So we'll start out with item 81 RPT-21127. Um, do we have anybody, any questions in regards to this? Okay. There's a recommendation here. I'll move it. Do we have a mover and a move by Councillor Coleman and seconded by Councillor Pierce. All in favor? Okay. Those opposed? If any? Seeing none, passed. Okay. Our just a point of, point, of, that, point of order. Point of order. I, I just think yeah. that when we when it's on the table, we do have to ask if there's any discussion, don't we? When it's actually on the table. Oh, okay. okay. I, maybe that's to the that's to the clerk. I don't know if that's maybe I'm misremembering, but I know you offered it beforehand. But I think once it's moved and seconded, we we do have to offer an opportunity to speak to it if anybody wants. Correct. Okay. Is there anybody that would like to speak to it? Okay. Seeing none. Thanks, Mark. Um, RPT-21-128, changes to the County of Brant Code of Conduct. Uh, Heather Boyd, recommendation is there, printed. Um, do we want a mover and a seconder to put it on the table? So moved by Councillor Wheat, second by Councillor Leferrier. Uh, do we have some discussion on this then? Some comments. Uh, Councillor Howes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I, I had one quick question related to section number three, and that is um, the, the part where it says uh, any personal information or any aspect of deliberations acquired by virtue of their office in either oral or written form, blah, blah, blah. So it just, it seems to me that at any point now or in the future, um, a resident of the, the community could say to us, why did you, why, you know, why did council decide or why did the county decide to do X, Y, Z? And, and obviously some of those meetings are, are the majority of our meetings are public meetings, but it, it, it just seems, I, I'm just curious, and it's like, I guess it's a question to staff, about does the, the if you read it the way it's written does that mean that that we can't explain to a, a a community member why a decision was made the way it was uh this section actually oh, we have a staff member would like to yep yeah, i can this section referring to yeah. the uh just the confidential session of our meetings so at no point in the future can we disclose what happened at those meetings unless there was action taken in open session as well. So sometimes we ratify a decision in open session and that can get communicated. Um, but any discussions or deliberations in camera, unless council specifically moves them to be released, can't be released. And I oh, think yeah. that's actually maybe a typo on the agenda. I think the, the report is correct, but it's section 9.1. Okay, thank you. That, I, I assume that's what it meant, but it, I wasn't quite sure that it was, it was spelled out that way in the words, but I, I do understand it. Thank you for the explanation. Do we have some other questions? Councillor Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a, a, a question on number three uh, with regard to uh, sorry, section two uh, with the acceptance of gifts and hospitality and the like uh, that we're not supposed to accept. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, oftentimes uh, when one attends a convention, uh, one may go to a, uh, a hospitality suite and uh, be offered a glass of wine or Coke or eat some peanuts or whatever. And that's a common practice uh, uh, and I'm just wondering how that jives with section two. Is that not allowed to do that? Uh, 
are we not uh, allowed to attend a dinner that's hosted by a uh, an engineering firm, for example, or accept uh, uh, a, a draft beer glass from Capital Paving or those kind of things? I, I'm I'm just really concerned about that because that's a has been and probably will be a common practice. So is that a violation of the code of conduct in, in, in that section number two? And I don't know who can answer that, but uh, it's a question that needs to be asked. Heather, are you able to answer that question? Well, what I can say is the only change being proposed is, is the bold part, just the explanation of it. Um, the rest of it's been a part of our code of conduct, um, at least the last several iterations of it. I would suggest that maybe that's a, a great question to ask of our integrity commissioner, ask for clarification. Because I think as she said last time, if she provides a ruling on that ahead of time, then she can't go back and then, you know, charge it, you know, declare someone is not followed the rule if we get clarification on it ahead of time. It is, it is a, a grayish area that uh, uh, we may fall victim to, we make someone unhappy. And uh, secondly, Mr. Chairman, uh, again, with regard to number two, I guess we'll have to uh, do what we do and hold our breath and, and see what happens. But uh, I, I have a question and a comment with regard to number six. I don't really understand the philosophy or the rationale behind that. And I don't uh, agree with that. Uh, and, and I would not be in favor of voting for that, but I need to understand the rationale. Why can't someone who's finished their term uh, seek employment with the county? So Heather, you wanna tackle that? I believe Michael can or probably Michael Bradley. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, can you just confirm you you can hear me? I'm using my iPad and I'm having lap, laptop problems. Got lots of thumbs yeah. up. Thank you. So um, the, the rationale behind this, it was it was included in the integrity commissioner's uh, recommendations as something council consider. Uh, I've dealt with this before, and I can I can suggest that it, it is complex. It's a complex situation for staff to be in as well as complex for counselors to be in at, after they, they cease to be a counselor. Um, you know, so my suggestion to put it in was, was, was for a couple of reasons. First of all, as you know, staff and counselors build strong relationships through their council term. And when that term ends, it, it is difficult to then move into a, an employment relationship very quickly. Um, so I thought that we, I, the clerk and I chatted and we thought a two year gap would be, would be an appropriate term. The second thing maybe is a little more serious uh, if, if a counselor were, former counselor was to be considered as a, as a future uh, employee, um, it's difficult for us as staff to, to, to defend that hire. It would, be, it would be difficult for us to defend that hiring position as an unbiased hiring position, uh, a decision. Um, very difficult. And this could uh, expose us to legal exposure um, you know, because cause, cause, uh, hirings, can be uh, litigious. Uh, there's there's usually several candidates, and and candidates that aren't successful uh, have been known to litigate, and they could uh, they they could perceive this as being unfair. So so we felt that uh, that a bit of a grace period in between the end of a counselor's role and uh, and when they could be considered for employment would be appropriate. It would put that buffer in between the uh, the, the the counselor's influence over the organization. Um, but but still not deny the ability of a counselor to eventually aspire to employment with with the, with the company. So that's our reasoning. Again, this is council's decision. We would respect it if uh, if you didn't. But I can say I have dealt with this before. It's it's an awkward thing for staff to deal with, and uh, and and that's why we put it forward. Hopefully, that answers the question. And that certainly does answer the question, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I can accept the uh, the rationale as explained by the uh, CAO. Um, Mayor Bailey. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I was just wondering, Michael, if you could comment on whether you thought that applied to committees too, whether someone was halfway through working on the police services board or the you know, an another paid board uh, once you're not a councillor or a mayor, 
uh, would you feel just as uncomfortable appointing someone to one of those committees as you would be hiring someone to work for the county? Th through, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and I think the clerk can correct me, but this the, the code of conduct does apply to both council as well as to members of the boards. And, and I would agree that the same thing applies with members of boards. It, again, it's the same level of, of concern around the awkwardness, as well as the same level of concern around the, the, the notion of being unbiased when we're making a hiring decision. And so I, I think it would apply. So. And Thank the you. clerk can correct me if I, I do believe that the, the code does apply to councillors as well as the members of boards. So. Thank you. Okay, Council Leferrier. Yeah, thank you. Just, I guess, a discussion point on this too is, you know, as a slightly younger person than some of the folks on council, I, you know, I could be uh, employed with the county one day and I wouldn't want to be um, right after my term, right? I think that would be also unfair to the person coming in, right? And that's another concern to think of. If, if I was, say, to apply uh, in a year and a half to a job as a social worker with the county of Brant, because, you know, I, I'm qualified to do so, um, and I got that job, I, I would feel a lot of... Um, um, pressure and a lot of sort of daggers um, from people in the community, uh, especially because I think in that immediate time, there is opportunities in the way we do things that we could have, you know, it, it could, the appearance of uh, setting up positions for people could happen. And I think this has happened in other municipalities where councillors have moved into roles that they voted to create when they were on council. And um, I think that that's also a grace period for a person. If in the unlikely situation, somebody does end up working for the county, that there isn't a direct policy uh, bridge between the person as a decision maker and a person as an employee. And I think that also would benefit anybody who in the future might end up working for the county in some capacity. So, um, can, but Michael, can you, can you answer, would this, would this the same be said, not for employees, but what about contracts? Because, you know, we have an open contract process for things. How does that work? Thank you, uh, Mr. And through you, I mean, I think in, in terms of like consulting contracts or things like that, I don't believe that would apply. That would probably be something move, that that wasn't the recommendation here. This is strictly for employment relationships. So, okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, three to Michael. Then, um, if I've heard you correctly, what you're saying is what's happened in the past couldn't continue in the future and I look to the case of a former councillor becoming a member of the committee of adjustment so you're saying with these new code of conduct rules that can't happen is that correct and I think I think you know who I refer to and I, I don't want to use names but it, through, through you Mr. Chair and, and the clerk can correct me if I'm wrong but this this is strictly about employment with with the municipality uh, not not in terms of the ability to join other boards or, or other other committees that, that council would support, which I believe would still be open to uh, to former council members. Uh, so again, just it's just exclusive. And maybe the question, the other question was, would 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 that 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 um, I guess maybe the, the embargo on employment apply to board members? And the answer would be yes. But it wouldn't it wouldn't preclude uh, former councillors from joining those other boards. Mike, Michael, I, I'm not either. I'm losing you in the translation here. Or I, I'm just, I'm really slow tonight. I'm not getting that. <laughs> You're saying councillor members can join boards or committees, I'm, I'm, but what what can't they join? They can't be employed. The, yeah, the, the the council member to, to to clarify, the council member would not be able to apply for. If council member could apply for a job, I guess we would we would decline the application for a two year period after their term ends. Okay, no, I'm clear. Okay, I think we're all clear on the employment. It's those boards that I'm not quite clear on. And, and let's use that example, committee of adjustment. There is some remuneration there. Um, but so under these rules, would somebody be able to be a member of the committee of adjustment or yeah. police services or, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, okay. Yes, yes, they would. Yes. However, the, the current members of the police services board or the committee of adjustment would not be able to apply for after they cease to become members um, oh, I would see. not be able to be apply for employment with the municipality. Those members. OK. My, or my two apologies. years. OK. 
I guess this is why we write the rules. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Councillor Gatward, did you have a question before I go to Chambers? I did, and Councillor Miller has um, had my question answered. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me speak a second time. I, I was just going to mention that I, I know and, and I assume Michael knows as well, uh, and maybe other members of council know of situations where members of council have resigned to take employment positions with municipalities. And that's why I, I was, uh, and, and as far as I know, there were, there were no, uh, uh, no issues associated with that, but uh, uh, I, I can accept the you know, rationale, but it, it does happen and it has happened. Uh, Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I know we're talking about six recommendations here, but the Integrity Commissioner offered us a, a whole suite of things. And I just want to say I support the things we have not brought forward for recommendations. So as well as saying I support these six items, I also support the number that, whatever the number is, we, we're not actually bringing forward. I think it was well argued. Thank you very much. And my understanding is a number of those recommendations will be going forward in the future reports for possible adoption. So that's something to be considered. So these were some ones they considered would be easily brought forward at this point. So, so is there any uh, further questions or discussion? Okay, well, we have a, a mover and a seconder. And so if we could um, vote on this to be moved to uh, council, I guess. So all those in favor? Okay. Those opposed? Okay, seeing none, it's passed. Okay, RPT-21-129, um, we have a recommendation. The County Integrity Commissioner contract. Um, do we have a, a mover and a seconder to bring it on the floor? Moved by Steve Howes, second by Mayor Bailey. And do we have some discussion on this? Councillor Gatward. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Through you to um, the clerk, Heather, the... Um, you did put in there, um, if needed, at one point, um, if we only have one bidder or one RFP for this particular position, then we won't be forming a committee to interview, et cetera, correct? Uh, through the chair, my understanding is We'd have the committee to look at whatever proposal or proposals come in. Uh, the committee will either recommend moving forward. If we had one, the committee could recommend moving forward with them. They could ask to hold an interview or they could you know, recommend going back to, to tender again. Um, I would suspect we'd have the committee either way. It's just whether or not they would need an interview might, might be up to the committee to determine. Okay. And is the current integrity commissioner um, allowed to reapply? Yeah, we didn't put anything, I didn't recommend any changes to limit the term. I thought, um, why would we want to limit ourselves when, when there's that option we might want to consider? Right, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Uh, Councillor Miller. I guess I should wait till we vote, but did you want to select the three can uh, three individuals tonight? That was, uh, I was going to recommend if there was people that would be interested in sitting on that committee, we could. If not, uh, Councillor Leferrier. I'd like to be Are on the committee. Are you volunteering? Volunteer. Yes. Okay. Councillor Gatward? I would volunteer. Okay. And Mayor Bailey. 
Are you volunteering or? Yes. Okay. So would we have any objections to those three? Uh, Councilor Chambers. No objections, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I was just gonna move that uh, uh, Councilors uh, Laferriere, Gatward, and uh, Mayor Bailey be appointed as the committee. Okay. And that can be well, an amendment. This is a question to Heather. Oh, okay, a friendly amendment. Just, uh, can, Councilor Miller. That can, be, that can be moved as an amendment to the yeah. uh, recommendation. I was gonna second the uh, amendment. Okay, so we have an uh, amendment. All in favor of the amendment? Okay, anybody opposed? Okay, seeing so no one opposed, then we can vote on the, um, the main recommendation then that's already been moved and seconded. There's no other further conversation. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, those who are opposed? Okay, that is passed. So do we have some communication, Heather? No, I have nothing this evening. Okay, so the Chief Administration Officer's update, Michael Bradley, you have a report for us tonight? Yeah, good evening, Mr. Chair. We have a short agenda tonight, so I was hoping to take a little bit of time and update council on the current status of our gypsy moth program, which I think uh, is, uh, is, is, is nigh upon us. And uh, it's worth, worth providing an update because I think probably by the date of our next meeting, some things will have happened. So I just wanna, if I'll just take about five minutes and do that, if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Uh, and then I also thought yeah. I would quickly touch on our, our what's going on with COVID-19. So, um, so just a reminder, the gypsy moth is an invasive pest and it, it's, uh, it's the caterpillar stage of the life cycle of that moth, uh, that moth that, that does create the damage. It, it eats the leaves of a range of native uh, deciduous trees uh, and it starts, starts hatching in late May. So we're seeing hatch now and I'll talk about that a little bit. And it feeds in right up until July and it can be quite destructive uh, in terms of defoliating uh, deciduous trees as well as coniferous trees. So just a reminder that council did approve a plan back through the budget that we would do two things we would be undertaking treatment uh, through aerial applications of, of county lands that have infestations of gypsy moth, as well as we would be assisting landowners to help them get, uh, get, get work with, uh, uh, help them get gypsy moth controlled on their properties through a number of ways. So I'll, I'll talk about the first one, the county lands um, approach first. So treatment is, is, is used uh, by, by applying a product called 4A, 48B, and the active ingredient to that is a, is a bacteria. It's a living bacteria held in stasis called Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT. It's a naturally occurring bacteria found in the soil, and it's used to, uh, to control caterpillars. Cater it's, tree it's dropped onto the canopy of a tree, and then caterpillars, as they eat in that canopy, they ingest the bacteria, and then they basically die from the inside. Um, it's a, it's a very effective way to treat gypsy moth for a couple of reasons. It's selective to feeding caterpillars only. And at the time when gypsy moth caterpillars are feeding, there are very few other caterpillars feeding at the time. And a lot of concerns about things like a, a monarch butterfly caterpillars. They're, they're, they won't be feeding in, in, in the landscape for quite a while. We're only seeing adult mar monarchs in the landscape right now. Uh, BT won't, won't affect adult, cat uh, adult uh, butterflies or moths. So. Uh, treatment, so our treatments will be happening over the next two weeks. Uh, they'll be treated by air, like I mentioned, and it's a very early morning activity. Usually about 6 p.m. is when we were doing the, doing the flights because we can't have any wind. Um, we're treating about 600 acres uh, here in, the, in, in, in county-owned land across a number of properties. And I think uh, we showed you those properties back in my original report back last fall. Um, we've issued a number of notices through uh, to the public, to neighbors of these properties. We posted the property. So we've done everything we have to to notify people that this is going on. Uh, we've contracted a company called General Air Spray. Uh, we, uh, we secured them through a, an RFQ process. And we're also partnering, partnering with GRCA to have a third party do uh, monitoring of the egg hatch because it's fairly scientific. 
And so there's, they're doing uh, egg monitoring um, on, on a couple sites here in the county um, for both us and the GRCA to help us coordinate our, our, our treatments. And right now we've got 25 to 75% of the eggs are hatched. We have very few oak leaves that have flushed out yet. So the, 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 the tiny, tiny little caterpillars aren't, aren't feeding yet. So, but we anticipate to see them start to feed and, 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 and leaves flushing out quite well next week and we anticipate to start to treat next week. So um, obviously what we want is 100% hatch uh, with caterpillars feeding, but not creating any damage. And then we would apply the treatment and hopefully knock the caterpillar populations back and get that under control. So uh, just to note that, that while generally, I think we've got strong support from the community to do this. We do have a few folks calling in who are not supportive of the treatment. They're concerned about the impacts of, of applying a, a product into the landscape. Um, we've, we've provided with assurances on the product. We've provided scientific data showing that it has very minimal impact on, uh, on the natural ecosystem. And we've also outlined that, you know, while, while it does have some nominal impacts on the natural ecosystem, the loss of forest cover would also be quite su significant to the ecosystem. So, so that's what we're doing in terms of our current treatment. And uh, we anticipate again in the next, uh, probably early next week, we might see our initial flights. Uh, there'll be two applications on these county properties. They all won't happen on the same day. So um, the other piece of that is providing assistance and our team over in community services that have been helping out. Jamie and Joanne have, uh, have been connected with about 400 residents throughout the county. Generally, I think the feedback has been good. Uh, I think most, most uh, residents are happy that we're helping out. A lot of them I think would have preferred to see the county take a uh, more active, you know, actually undertake the, the treatments, but I think we're all aware of what the costs of that would have been. So we've helped residents uh, connect with treatment services, help them fill out the paperwork, help them connect with their neighbors to get some critical mass to do that. And I think generally it's gone well, I've got some good feedback about that. So um, after we're done with, the, the, with, with our treatments, as well as the private landowners uh, have, have, have had their treatments on their properties, We'll go out and do assessments across the landscape and some some sample plots to determine what the status is of the of the outbreak after these treatments. Hopefully, we're able collectively to uh, to push the the uh, population back and bring it under control and reduce the amount of forest cover loss that we might otherwise see. Now, what usually happens with gypsy moth populations is just after they reach an outbreak, they usually do a collapse. Um, they become overpopulated. There's a, there's a virus, I can't even pronounce it, it's a long word, um, that, 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 that impacts the, the caterpillars and they die from the virus. Um, so that will likely happen, but we don't know. It, it'll happen this year or it may not happen this year, it may happen next year. Um, but, but we're certainly at the historical point in the size of these outbreaks where we would see uh, the, the, the caterpillar populations basically collapse and return to a, a manageable uh, level. And then that'll carry for, for a decade or so, and then we'll probably see an outbreak like we're seeing now. So, um, so that's, that's my update on gypsy moss. Um, it's a good reminder, like we've, we were fortunate, we had a, a, a contracted staff member who went to school for forestry. She had a bit of a steep learning curve, but has been able to help us out. Joanne over in, in community services really done a lot of work as well, just keeping connected with, with, uh, with landowners. I put a, a bit of my time in as well to help out. And we've been able to, 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 to do this, but we don't really have any, any uh, full-time forestry um, capacity here in the county. And I think urban forestry and, 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 and woodlot, woodlot resources are becoming a, a, an important part of our landscape and, and a focus for the community. And so that's a, that's a resource area that I'll be revisiting and probably uh, coming back to council with some thoughts on in the future. So that's, uh, that's what's going on with gypsy moth and hopefully that, uh, that, that gives council a good update on where we are with that. And we're continuing to have lots of dialogue with, with residents, help them out where we can. And I think generally we've had a fairly successful program this year. Um, Mr. Chair, I can stop there and then maybe get to my COVID update if there's any questions on gypsy moths. Looks like there are some. Councillor House. Well, thanks yeah. Mr. Chair, through you real I actually was approached by a, a, a resident in Paris today about about this and and um, and I understand that we're, we're applying the insecticide by aircraft and and it would it be accurate for me to respond to a, an in-town inquiry by by saying that it's it's only rural um, property owners that we can assist in this regard it's impossible to target um, individual properties in town. 
Mr. Chair, through you, um, certainly if that if that uh, if that property owner wants to reach out, um, we can certainly uh, we can talk to them. You know, urban urban environments control tends to be a little easier. Um, and I got a couple family members that I've been helping with this, where you can actually physically scrape the egg masses off and, and get them under control. There's there's still time to do that, not a lot of time. Um, but but we uh, in terms of control in the urban environment, it's a little more challenging because you can't hire an air service to do one property. Right. Uh, and we, we haven't seen the outbreak levels in the urban setting that would really warrant uh, an urban control program at this point. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly a population in some of the urban areas, but it's not, it, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not as substantive as what's going on in some of the woodlot portions of the community, like a Clark Road and, 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 uh, and around, uh, around um, just north of Burford, place like that, which we have four or 5,000 egg masses per, per acre, so. But we, we could direct uh, urban, um, property owners to gypsy moth at brand.ca. Absolutely. We can send them uh, lots of information. Um, there's still a lot of things that urban uh, land re residents can do. Again, they, they, it's still not too late to scrape uh, gypsy moth egg masses right now to uh, basically get them out of the landscape. And then once they're hatching, there's a, there's a tree banding that can be done with burlap or sticky tape. Duct tape works fine. A lot of things can do. The gypsy moth uh, caterpillars are not the brightest things in the world so they go up and down the trunk over the course of their day and they're easily trapped so um and they can you can hose them off there's a lot of things we can do we can certainly walk residents through that but depending on what the residents capabilities are happy to help with that so thank you uh councillor pierce um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to, to Michael, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to uh, Jamie Emerson. I've spoken to a few people and directed them her way and have had very positive feedback back from them. And I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Chambers, first now go to Councillor Gatwood, yeah, sorry. Okay, am I up? I, I just wanted to. Uh, uh, yeah, you're thank, right. I just wanted to thank Michael for mentioning the uh, uh, monarch butterfly caterpillars because the chemical will kill the uh, monarch caterpillars, and that's why the timing is so important. I had a, a couple of uh, people uh, uh, question me about that, and I can now answer them uh, uh, fully. Uh, so the monarch uh, butterfly, which are under tremendous stress right now, are not uh, affected as long as the timing is uh, appropriate. So I'm glad you pointed that out. And just with that, if, if I might, Mr. Chairman, uh, we did have a, a presentation at Long Point Region about the monarch butterfly. There's a group of uh, uh, ecologists that are uh, doing a, the last year they ran uh, a relay from uh, uh, I think it was Peterborough to Mexico following the path of the monarch butterfly migration. And as a fundraiser, they uh, uh, ran the whole distance. And uh, due to the pandemic this year, they can't run to Mexico. So they are running around in Southern Ontario. And in the fall, the uh, relay for the monarchs will be passing through uh, Paris. Uh, so uh, keep your eyes open for the uh, running butterfly group that are uh, bringing awareness to the uh, uh, stress that the monarch butterflies are in. And I did mention that to Russell Press, and there will be some uh, information provided perhaps to members of council. But in the fall, there will be a, a relay run for the monarchs running through Paris. So stay tuned. Okay. Uh, Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I have a comment that I wanted to thank Councillor Miller for bringing this issue forward before budget last year because we did have a significant number of properties in the eastern part of Ward 5 that participated in the spraying program, and I think they were quite pleased that um, they could get information from the county to help them. And the second thing I was wondering uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the CAO, um, the Township of North Dumfries 
was interested in piggybacking uh, with Brant. Do you know if that happened or not? So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I reached out to the, my colleague at, at North Dumfries uh, in January, I believe, and uh, I think he, uh, he indicated that they weren't interested, and I don't. I didn't think they had any money in the budget to do this. So, um, so, so we didn't. We didn't. We, we didn't join up with that, but I did, I did reach out. Um, I think it was probably mid January after the budget got up, approved. So. Okay. Thank you for okay. uh, reaching out because I thought if Mayor Fox didn't ask me, I would have an answer. Thank you. So is there any further questions regarding gypsy moss? So, okay. So uh, Michael, if you want to continue with your, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So I just have a few things I, I, I thought it'd be a good chance just to continue to keep council uh, apprised of, of our COVID-19 um, uh, response. We are in a bit of a holding pattern right now. Our EOC met this morning uh, to start our 103rd business cycle for the COVID-19 emergency. I am pleased that uh, over last week and as well as this week, some municipal staff did qualify to receive uh, essential worker vaccines. At, a, at, 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 at special clinics that were set up for those. Um, those, uh, the, the, those staff were, uh, were listed in accordance with the provincial guidelines around the group one and two of phase two of the current vaccination initiative, as well as our own pandemic response plan. So um, these additional vaccinations, as well as, as other staff members that have already received vaccinations, uh, just improves our workplace resilience as we face the, uh, the fairly significant third wave of COVID-19. So I'm pleased with that. Um, last week was Mental Health Week uh, here in, 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 in Canada, I believe, and uh, we acknowledged this in our workplace with some internal messaging, as well as a lunch and learn workshop that was led by our HR team, and it was well attended. Um, workplace mental health is, is important uh, to us as a management team here at the county, and it's an important topic right now because COVID-19 has made the workplace challenging. COVID fatigue and COVID exhaustion are real in, in a lot of workplaces, ours, not, ours included. And I think these uh, proactive initiatives to engage staff and make sure that they're both physically and mentally well is important to a, to a healthy workplace. So uh, we're pleased that that's, that's taken place. And we, uh, we will continue with proactive workplace mental health ish, uh, initiatives um, going forward. So, And then um, I just want to, uh, to, to mention that we've had some discussions uh, internally and it, it was discussed at our EOC meeting uh, that we've received quite a bit of correspondence and continue to re receive correspondence and messaging from contractors, from consultants, from trade associations, from our municipal colleagues, uh, just about the evolving impacts that COVID-19 is having on the supply chain, on the labor market, on the availability of labor, on uh, the, the cost of materials, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think this is a surprise to any of us. We hear it all the time. Um, but especially the third wave is having downward pressure on productivity and upward pressure on costs. And again, we're hearing that in a, from a lot of sectors and from a lot of, um, a lot of, 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 of places. So, um, you know, we, uh, we are, are, are very aware of this and we're aware that it may influence our 2020 capital program as it comes forward um, in terms of pricing, in terms of our ability to get work done. Uh, and so uh, Rob Walton and his team are huddling on this right now. And they're gonna be talking with their consulting network and their municipal colleagues and we'll be bringing a report back on the status of the 2020 capital plan and uh, letting you know if there's any, we think there's any projects that are at risk of maybe either not going forward or projects we may want to hold on because we would be getting pretty disadvantages, disadvantages pricing uh, right now for those projects. So I think we're going to have to be nimble on this and we'll keep council apprised of this through appropriate reports. So. Um, Mr. Chair, that's my, my report. And I, I know it was quite long today, but hopefully that covered off some, some important topics, uh, given that we had a little bit of time tonight. So happy to answer any further questions. Okay, do we have any questions? Uh, Councillor Miller. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, three to Michael. Michael, the, um, you don't use CPI um, when you're calculating out costs for, as uh, you know, bridge building and things like that go up in price. What, what, what's that measure you use? It's a uh, producer or no, what do you use? We've used the construction price index. That's it. Okay. And when does uh, that? Sorry, sorry. When does that come? Does that come out quarterly, annually, monthly? 
Mr. Chair, I, I believe it's 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 updated monthly. It's it's a twelve month trailing um, uh, uh, construction price index. Um, so we we would have used that. We would have usually probably taken and, and Robin would probably know this better. I'll, I'll I'll query her, but I believe we would have taken the November construction price index, twelve month trailing construction price index, when we were setting the, uh, the increasing the capital budget this year, and we would have used it along with 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 other metrics to uh, to set pricing for capital projects, but. Um, you know, we're hearing we're hearing things like, you know, some some uh, supplies, you know, supplies and materials are seeing 30, 40, 45, 50 percent in uh, year over year increase in prices right now, given supply chain issues, especially uh, coming out of Europe and, and Asia and, uh, and 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 things like that. So so we're, we're very wary of this. And, uh, and again, uh, Rob and his team are, are on it and we'll be making recommendations if we have to. So. Okay, I'll look. I can look that up myself, and I will look it up because I, I suspect it's running probably north of ten percent or something. So as a consumer, yeah, it, it it kind of blows, but as an investor, it's great. So okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, is there any other questions? Okay, uh, Councillor Gatward. Thank you. I didn't tell Michael said Europe and Asia. What? products would our um, Rob Walton's group be using from those places? Thank you, Mr. I mean, I, I, I mean, I just have no idea. Um, I know steel is, is, is problematic right now. We don't buy a lot of steel, but we do have some facilities projects um, that are, that are drifting around. Um, there's, there's a lot of, 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 of materials that we would be buying. I don't know where the supply chain is, but this is, this is a global impact. If, if a supply chain from a, from a portion of the globe winds down, it drives su supplies in, in, in domestic markets, the cost of domestic product up because there's a greater demand for it. So it's, again, that, that, that was my point. So. I see. I was just thinking about asphalt, gravel, the things we build roads with and Thank you for your explanation. Okay. Do we have any uh, other questions for uh, Michael? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for the update. It's much appreciated for the insights. Um, I know the price of two by fours have gone up about 300%. So I don't think I'll be doing any decks this year. So. Uh, now on to other business. Um, Robert, you had, uh, Councillor Chambers, you had a, a piece for that? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll leave this to your discretion whether a, a motion is in order or not, but I just, uh, looking at our agenda this evening was rather short and I uh, uh, have a suggestion that uh, uh, for future agenda items, uh, two items, if I might, one, uh, I don't know whether Rob Walton is, is with us tonight or not, but uh, our recent uh, uh, hiring of a drainage superintendent uh, consulting firm, uh, I, when we talked about that originally, we talked about establishing a, a proactive uh, drainage uh, uh, program. And I would like a, a, a kind of a policy discussion on drainage uh, and uh, uh, farm drainage is what I'm referring to, if I might, uh, at some point. I don't know whether Rob is on, wants to speak to that or not, but uh, at the very least, we should be getting uh, uh, reports from the drainage superintendents on an annual basis uh, to uh, circumvent the situations where people have been asking uh, for drainage maintenance to be done for five, six, and seven years. So I would like a, a policy review on drainage, uh, farm drainage, uh, if I might, and maybe Michael wants to speak to that. Yeah, th Michael, through you like to uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, th through you, Mr. Yeah, Rob's not with us this evening, um, but but I th think yeah, he's he's actually mentioned he's quite passionate about this subject, and I'm sure we could ha happily have a, a, a bit of a policy uh, framework for uh, proactive drain uh, 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 municipal drains. Uh, come forward, this would be a great venue for it. So we'll add that to our task list. So. Yes, and, and I would appreciate that. And I'm sure some of the uh, uh, the farmers in the area would appreciate that as well. Just if, if councillors don't know uh, the drainage uh, 
uh, when, when drains are maintained, the costs are apportioned back to the uh, property owners. So it's not a, uh, a tax-based uh, uh, ex expense. It's, it's an assessed uh, uh, onto the property owners, unlike urban drainage. Uh, the second thing, if I might, uh, and maybe Michael can uh, comment on this as well, we've had a lot of discussion on uh, uh, cannabis. Uh, and I had mentioned at one point that uh, Brant County does not have a standalone cannabis bylaw. It works the cannabis uh, uh, regulations into our comprehensive zoning bylaw with uh, site plan control, et cetera. And, and we're all aware of that. Uh, many municipalities have a standalone cannabis production bylaw. And I would like a discussion on that uh, if, if I might uh, uh, request that uh, at, at some point, probably sooner rather than later, uh, in regards to such things as uh, outdoor production, uh, odors, uh, uh, abatement, and, and things like that within the bylaw. Uh, we all saw the uh, Leamington bylaw, which uh, is, is very restrictive uh, in comparison to some municipalities, including ours. So I would like a, a, a presentation on a draft, a cannabis uh, production bylaw. Uh, and I think that would uh, uh, go a long way to uh, uh, reconcile some of the difficulties people are having with cannabis uh, production facilities uh, cropping up in, in their area that are, uh, uh, not looked upon that favorably. So maybe Michael can uh, speak to that as well. Okay. Michael? Certainly, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. And, and yeah, and I think um, Ms. Zudema, actually that we had some discussion about this a little while ago. It was in camera, so I won't, I won't elaborate on it, but she has reached out to some colleagues as was advised, and she is ready to report back on those discussions at next week's administration and operations committee. And I, I think that you can get her feedback on that. And then probably uh, we could have a discussion about the, the next steps on that, which then may be a good topic for this committee as a, as a policy change. So, um, so yeah, that, that, will, that will be happening uh, in the very short term. And, and I'll conclude, Mr. Chairman, by just saying it, it's this committee that, uh, uh, the way I understand it, is, is a committee to uh, look at various policies and have policy type discussions. And those are the, the uh, two things that come foremost to my mind, but uh, I know there are many, many more. Mm -hmm. And I, I thank you for uh, allowing me to place those items for consideration on other business. Well, I appreciate both those items. Um, now the, the first one, do we need to give a direction to staff to come back to us with a report, Heather? I, we don't need a motion for that. It's direction to staff, and Michael's taken the notes, so I'm sure we're good. Okay. Okay. So, so I look forward to hearing more about both of those issues. They're both issues that we face in our ward here. One, I've had a couple of farmers approach me about drainage issues in the past, and uh, so, yeah, it's important to keep on top of that. So. Um, we have no in-camera business, and so then it's just the next meeting and a motion to adjourn. There's no other comments. or So we have a motion from Councillor Leferrier, and we second by Councillor 